all we all we want is to just be parents more than anything in the whole world. <sighs> Unfortunately, I feel like I'm never going to be a mother. It kills me to think that he would want to be a dad, but I can't like make that a reality. It's not, it's not so much that. I just think we would both be good parents. Hi guys, I actually can't believe I'm sitting here filming this video right now. I am a mommy. <laughs> I can't believe it. Today I am going to finally be talking to you about my birth story. So if you don't know the backstory, if you haven't followed me, I'm gonna give a brief rundown. Uh, infertile for 15 years, been with my husband for 15 years. We were told we weren't gonna be able to get pregnant, so we decided we were gonna live as child-free people. And uh, there's a lot more backstory to that. In 2020, March, I found out that I was pregnant. And I it threw us for a loop. I mean, we never thought we would be parents in a million billion years. And here we are, and now we have our little miracle baby. And oh, I, I have so many things to say about being a mom, but wow, I love that kid more than I could ever put into words. You guys, it's disgusting. I can't even believe I'm sitting on camera right now finally talking about this because it has been a long time. I am nine weeks postpartum as I'm filming this. I finally feel able to talk about my birth. Um, I have so much to say. This video is going to be really long and there is going to be a disclaimer and I would really, really appreciate if you would listen to this disclaimer instead of just skipping past it to the birth story because it matters that you hear this because it just, it matters, okay? So I just need to give a disclaimer. This story is difficult for me to talk about for many different reasons. Here's the thing. So I was a birth doula for a few years. If you don't know what that is, it's a birth support partner. So I'm not a midwife, but somebody that is hired by the parents to help in birth. So it's usually in the case that the mom wants an unmedicated birth and she is asking for the doula to be there to support her in that, to help with like positioning and back rubs and to be there as a labor support for the dad and the mom. So I did that for a few years. When you do a job like that, I've seen all different kinds of births. I've been, I have attended 
home births, birth center, hospital, hospital where the mom is trying to go unmedicated, some with epidural and some C-sections. So I've seen the spectrum and I just knew that if I ever were to have a baby, which I never thought was possible, but that I would for sure want to have, like if you had your dream birth, that for me was a home birth in the tub, bringing my baby up. I wanted everything to be very calm, serene, peaceful. So the disclaimer of this video is that I am going to tell you my hopes for what I wanted my birth to be. And then I'm gonna tell you my birth story. Now, I know that when people open themselves up online like this, like when people, you know, come out and, and ultimately are vulnerable and talk about, you know, their hopes and this and that and what happened, people have an opinion. And the reason it has taken me nine weeks to be able to film this video is because I don't want to hear it. I, I have been in therapy for eight weeks now because it was really traumatic for me what happened during my birth. Now, you may have a more traumatic story. You may have a different story than me. In context of what I thought my birth might be like to what it ended up being and some of the events that happened, it was extremely traumatic for me. I am one of those people that really likes to stay in the positive. I like watching positive birth stories. I took the birth course, the positive birthing companies, you know, hypnobirthing. So I am all about positive birth stories. And because I inundated myself with only that prior, I expected my birth to be that. And it really, really blindsided me. And so I am gonna be talking today about just exactly what I experienced. I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. Parts of it were great. Um, most of it was not, and most of it was so opposite of what I thought it was going to be. So my disclaimer is this. If you have something shitty to say, if you value commenting here on my channel or being a member or part of this community, be kind. I don't wanna hear what I should have done differently. You know, I don't wanna hear the horror stories or my birth was so much worse or you should have done this and then this wouldn't have happened the thing is is that when you talk about birth specifically online or motherhood in general and i've discovered this in the last nine weeks there's very very little things that people have a bigger opinion about than parenthood and it's because everybody has their own experience everyone has their own opinions and everybody wants to give you those opinions whether they be positive or extremely negative negative. and i have never in my life experienced such positivity and such negativity on such um, extreme scales on both sides. And it, it's, it's unbelievable. And so uh, postpartum has been extremely difficult for me and I'm gonna make videos specifically about that. So if you're interested in hearing about the postpartum journey, <laughs> bitch it has been a journey so i'm gonna get into it but i just needed to give the disclaimer of like please be kind in the comments or i'm gonna shut them off because i really cannot hear it right now um and i know a lot of people are like you don't go into birth with a plan having a plan is stupid because ultimately your plan probably isn't gonna happen i didn't have a birth plan but i had birth preferences and i was told to make that by my midwives and when i got eventually to where i gave birth they were very happy that I had that and said that almost every parent comes in with their birth preferences because if they can, they would like to accommodate those preferences for you. So to have preferences is not a bad thing, but sometimes things will stray. By the way, I was never gonna have a home birth because it got canceled due to COVID. So I was the, ultimately the plan was that I give birth at the birth center where I had been working with my midwives this entire time. The plan or preferences were unmedicated at the birth center, which is only about 15 minutes from where we live, and hopefully a water birth. And I would bring the baby up and it would be this like magical moment. And then you're discharged like four to six hours afterwards, as long as everybody's healthy and good. Let's get into how it, it did go. This all started on November 30th. The 29th, actually, Zach and I had a photo shoot out here on the property. I just, I was like, you know what? I need to get one maternity photo shoot in before we give birth. And I just had a feeling like we need to do it today because we were getting close. I was getting really uncomfortable and I was starting to have like mild contractions here and there. That night before I went into labor, I was feeling just weird. I was feeling different. And Zach and I were sitting downstairs in front of the fire and I got on all hands and knees, like on the chair, like I was slipped around because I was having trouble, like just getting a good breath in because the baby, it was humongous in there. Well, 
really not, but we'll get to that. <laughs> By the way, I was 39 weeks, I think exactly this day, the 29th. I think I was exactly 39 weeks. And um, I got on my hands and knees and I was like, I looked at him and I was like, we need to get the birth bag packed tonight. Like, I just feel like we need to solidify it tonight. Cause it was, all, we had all the stuff sitting there, but it was like kind of strewn about. So we got everything packed up that night. And thank God we did because the next morning, so I had a decent, really actually good night's sleep. I woke up at five o'clock in the morning on the dot, looked at my phone, and I went to turn over in bed. And when I turned over, I heard a pop. I heard it and felt it. It felt like a non-painful rubber band snap up inside of my vagina slash belly. And I felt the snap and I was like, uh-oh. And then as soon as I shifted my weight, it was like a gallon of liquid came pouring out of me in bed. I woke him up and he woke up in a panic and I said, my water broke. And he was like, no, -uh, jumped up. We were panicking, you guys. We were running around the room. We didn't know what to, I wasn't running. I was standing there just like gushing fluid all over the floor. My water broke. <laughs> I just heard a pop and gushing. Oh my goodness. Oh. And I, I started immediately like shaking because out of nerves, like I, my adrenaline just went sky high. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe we're having a baby today. That moment, I will never forget that moment. It just felt like whoosh. It just like this huge realization that like there is no going back. We are having this baby within the next couple of days. <laughs> and it really was a couple of days. And I called my midwife on call. It's five o'clock in the morning, so nobody was there yet. And asked me like what color the fluid was. And initially I said clear because on the floor it looked clear. Well, it's on a, you know, like golden wooden floor. I went to the bathroom and the fluid was not clear. It was like slightly yellowish greenish tinged and weirdly had a bunch of hair in it. Apparently that's kind of normal. I talked to the midwife about it and she was like, yeah, sometimes the fluid can have hair in it because the baby like sheds their lanugo, which is like that little body hair that they have. So I call the midwife back and I tell her that. And she says that it's likely meconium, which means that the baby had his first poop inside of my belly instead of outside. And this happens not all the time, but it's not super uncommon. It can happen, but it's also a risk factor. And another thing is as soon as your water breaks, and I don't know if you guys know this, but you're on a time limit. Now that you're on a clock of 24 to 48 hours before they have to get the baby out, because the longer your water is broken, your membranes are ruptured, infection can get up in there and you can get a uterine infection. It can be risky for you and the baby. You're on a time clock, which sucks because if you don't progress, everyone's looking at their watch. And by the way, that's like one of the things that makes you progress less because as soon as everyone's looking at you like dilate, you're like, I'm trying. She said, we'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning. We would like you to come in. As soon as the clinic opens, we'll check you out. If you are, you know, dilating, progressing, we'll have you stay. So get your bag and everything like that. So I took a shower. I tried curling my hair as if that mattered in the slightest. I'm so glad I took a shower though, because I didn't get another one for days. It's 6.42 AM on, what's the date? November 30th. It came before your duty. Uh, I woke up this morning at five, pretty much on the dot, to the sound. It wasn't so much a pop as it was like a snap. And uh, my water broke. So. <laughs> so here she is doing her hair. Well. I can't leave this in my hair, it'll burn off. Yeah. Okay, so I have, the, the, it's weird, it just goes away. And right now it says my contractions are two and a half minutes apart. Wow. But they're lasting only about 35 to 45 seconds. So. Yeah. Um. Stop it. I don't oh, know. If, if it is meconium, they have to make a judgment call, like if it looks like just a little bit, if it looks like a lot, I might have to give birth at the hospital, which I didn't want because I don't know any of the providers there. And But yeah. we did write it out, I mean, in case... Yeah, if you, yeah. you have your birth preferences sheet. They're really close together though, which is like just a little bit concerning. They're like, when they're five minutes apart, lasting a minute for an hour. Well, they're one minute apart lasting 35 seconds. Yeah. So what does that mean? Yeah. And I tried to remember what a contraction feels like to be able to tell you. I experienced many different levels of contractions. I will say that the initial ones are different, intense, 
kind of period crampish, but worse. They are wave-like. They do come in a wave pattern. Now I experienced a lot, so stay tuned for what I'm gonna say about contractions later. Okay, so I've always wanted to have somebody explain to me what contractions feel like. So right now, they feel like really intense period cramps. Am I gonna have one? Yes, hang on. Intense in my lower back. Wonder if I'm having, like I wonder if he's posterior um, because they're only really in my lower back completely. Um, it doesn't mean that he can't come out. You can have a posterior baby, it's just way harder, so. Flip! <laughs> he might not be, it could just be where I experience pain, you know? Like, um, pro intensity, not pain. It doesn't, okay, it hurts. I guess hurt is subjective. On a scale of one to 10 right now, in the midst of one, it's like a four. So we'll see if it gets to 10. You know, a minute goes by pretty fast and you have some reprieve in the middle, so don't be scared. I don't know why I'm like giving you a pep talk as if you're in labor watching this right now. Don't be scared, you're gonna, be, I'm giving myself pep talk, Christy, don't be scared. <laughs> Oh, 45 more minutes. Is this what I'm gonna be doing? 45, 44 more minutes. <laughs> yes, that is what I'm gonna be doing. And we were so nervous. And so we got in the car and we headed there and I had a bunch of contractions in the car and I was so excited because this was gonna be the birth of my dreams. midwife that I really vibed with was the one that was on call and so I was so excited and so I get to the birth center and she meets me there and she checks me and I was two centimeters dilated and 50% effaced which was really exciting things seemed like they were on their way and since my water had broken instead of going back home they were like you know what the room's empty you might as well just stay and labor here oh. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna take my fingers out. Okay, I got it. It's like a two, like 50%. Okay, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you're dilating. <laughs> Good. Cool. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And I, I labored there for a few hours and until I got checked again. I took a hypnobirthing class beforehand. It's a positive birthing company's hypnobirthing. And all that is, is basically a way if you're looking to have an unmedicated birth, which if you don't know what that means, is basically you're trying to avoid an epidural if you can. I'm not again medication or epidurals or anything like that it's just that I didn't personally want one that's literally it I just wanted to experience and feel everything as it was and I wasn't at a hospital I was at a birth center that was just a couple minutes away from a hospital in case there's an emergency it's literally a two-minute transfer like it's that quick you know midwives are capable of handling all of that on their own uh, a lot of people think that like midwives don't have anything on hand but they have pretty much everything that the hospital has other than the ability to do a c-section but they have oxygen they have sutures they have antibiotics they have pitocin they have all of that as well it's just that you you're not in a hospital setting. So there's, it's a lot more lax and it's a lot more, like it feels like you're in your home, but you're not. Just be able to move around freely, to be able to squat, to be able to just feel it. I just really wanted to feel the entire experience and have the really positive, calm experience. Like when my son was born, I wanted him placed on my chest and to have skin to skin and to have like a really gentle breastfeeding experience and delayed cord clamping so he could have all of his blood and basically the birth that my sister had. My sister gave birth at the same place and it was beautiful. It was exactly that. It was so wonderful. And I just really wanted to experience it because I got to be there when my niece was born and it was a beautiful, wonderful, empowering experience that I really wanted to have. But they try to reframe your brain around pain. So I'm telling you this because it matters. It matters to the story. So it's all about allowing your body's oxytocin to take over. And the more oxytocin you have, which is basically like the love hormone and the one that helps you dilate and the one that brings on your contractions and everything like that, the more of that hormone you have and the more you push away adrenaline, the more likely you are to dilate and have your labor be quicker and more positive. I get to the birth center, start laboring in the room, Zach's pushing on my back and I'm going through contractions. <sighs>
they got intense very fast. Uh, I could look in my app, but I be believe my contractions were anywhere from two to four minutes apart, but they were kind of closer to like that two and a half minutes. They were one on top of the other. It was really, really intense. And I was like, you know what? These are really good contractions. I'm for sure like not gonna have a long labor at all. Okay. <laughs> so about four hours of laboring later, so it was about noon, the midwife came in and checked me and I was at three centimeters dilated and 50% effaced. And I was like, well shit, okay, one centimeter in the last four hours, not great, but something. Kept laboring, kept laboring. And about two or three hours later, she came in and checked me again because she said, that sounded different. I was grunting, I was kind of screaming, I was throwing up, I for sure, thought that I was in transition, which is when you get to like eight, nine centimeters and you're almost ready to start pushing. Because of how I was acting, these contractions were so intense, so intense. I mean, I'm talking like, I kept looking at Zach and I was like, holy shit, dude, these are like, what the feck? Like they are so much. Oh. And I, there were one on top of the other and just having these contractions back to back. And I was getting sick because it was really intense, okay? Like a lot. It's like, you know, I was like, it's like a five. Okay, this one's like a 10 at the height. <sighs> You're quite there yet. No. Oh. You think you're there, but you're not there. That's true. You've never known anything. <laughs> That's true. No. There's people who've done it 20 times. Those people are crazy. <laughs> 20 fucking times? The only way I would do it 20 times is if they could guarantee that every single time it was 100% less length long. Like, I want, I, I... 20 times, though? Never 20, two, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I would do it, too. two. Two. Doing great. And midwife came in, she's like, I feel like you're getting there. Let me check you again. Three centimeters. Oh my fuck. 
checks me, three centimeters dilated, 50% effaced. Now keep in mind, when there is meconium in the fluid, that is another sign that they need to get the baby out sooner rather than later because they can have issues breathing when there's meconium in the fluid. But because it was so light, they didn't think it was gonna be a problem, but they did let me know that we really need to get the baby going and that it would be the same in the hospital, which it was. They really wanna make sure that they're getting the baby out and that they're monitoring frequently and making sure that the baby's doing well, which he always was. But that's what the meconium in the water is, is a problem because it is them breathing in their fluid with poop in it. So that's not good. So then that was at about 2 p.m. that she checked me and I was at three centimeters still. So then I kept laboring, kept laboring, kept laboring. She checked me again at five because she really wanted to see, am I making progress at all? Text me again three centimeters dilated, 50% effaced. At this point, it's about 5 p.m. And I, you know, had been in labor. My water had broken, it was 12 hours at this point. And I was like, gosh, I've got to be dilated by this point. Like I've got to be halfway there. It was so painful, it was so intense. One on top of the other, just experiencing contraction after contraction. And because my water had broken, the midwife came in and she said, I know this isn't what you wanna hear and I know this is devastating for you because I can see your birth preferences but I'm gonna give you two more hours. And if you haven't made any progress in the next two hours, then we're gonna have to transfer you to a hospital. And I was devastated because I really, really, really like my midwives. I had been with them the entire time. They know me. They've been with me for nine months pregnant. I know them, I'm comfortable with them. And now they're telling me that I have to transfer to a place where I don't know anybody, where COVID's going on. So there's gonna be all this different stuff that has to happen. I have to drive far away because they didn't actually wanna transfer me to the hospital that was two minutes from there. They wanted to transfer me to one that was 45 minutes from there, which I'll explain why in a little bit. So I am crushed at this point. I am absolutely crushed. And I said, I wanna get in the zone and I'm gonna to try to get this cervix to open. I was doing lunges, I was squatting, I was positive affirmations. I had my AirPods in and I was just going around the room like, let's get this going, let's get things going. I was squatting in the corner. I was doing everything humanly possible to get the baby to move down into the correct location of my cervix and my pelvis to dilate my cervix. Two hours go by and in that two hours, after she told me this, I got this rush of adrenaline when she told me that because I was like, shit, now we're on a timeline. I had two contractions in two hours. I went from every two minutes to as soon as she told me that, one contraction an hour. It literally stopped and halted my contractions. There's no way I could dilate because I wasn't having any. And that was so devastating for me because I just knew. So she checked me again at 7 p.m. Lo and behold, three centimeters dilated, 50% effaced. And she was like, okay, we need to talk about transfer. So she gives me everything and tells me everything that we need to do. I was not dilating. And what she said was, hopefully if we get you to a hospital, they can give you Pitocin in a very small amount and hopefully that will get your cervix to dilate and you can have the unmedicated birth that you want. And I, I, I said to her, I said, am I gonna be able to handle the pain of Pitocin contractions? And she's like, some people can, some people can't, but hopefully you don't need very much and it'll just get things going. And I was crushed, you guys. I was literally, I just didn't wanna have to get in the car, drive 45 minutes while having contractions, have a bunch of people that I didn't know ultimately it was necessary. So we, we, she discharges me, tells me everything that I need to know. I cried in her arms. I was so upset. I cried the entire way to the hospital, which was a 45 minute drive. It's 8.17 PM. And for the last like three, three hours, we've been discussing what to do if, uh, because I am not dilating. And when I got there this morning at eight, I was at a two. And when they rechecked me again at like 11, I was three. And then when she rechecked me again at four, I was at three. three. So she gave me two more hours and said, if I don't progress at all, then I had to be transferred to the hospital. <laughs> and I didn't progress at all. I tried. I'm trying not to be upset. I know that I was talking about fluid, fluid plans and everything. But when you, when you have a, a 
hope. <laughs> hope for your birth. We're gonna have we're gonna have hope still. It's nothing. nothing I just changed. don't know just anybody <laughs> there. I don't know That's anybody. Okay. I'm scared. You're gonna know, <laughs> you're gonna know me. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. I'm gonna be there the whole time. I'm trying to reframe my brain to uh, be okay with whatever happens here, and it's you know, really it's hard for me because you give birth vaginally to a healthy big boy to give me a little bit of pitocin or something because my contractions just aren't doing anything, even though they're really strong and they were really close together for a lot of them. But you know, if I just have to reframe my brain, try not to be like this. It's just, you know, when things go differently than you had anticipated, even though you're supposed to go into it with like no expectations, um, it still can be really rough. So we're on our way to the hospital and uh, cause we'll see you when we get there. If they let us film anything, I don't know. Each place has their own like standard of care and the way that they do things and kind of their procedures and policies. And to keep it as close to what I had already had at this you know birthing center that I had been going to, they transferred me to a hospital that was a midwife led unit. So it was, it's a hospital, but the doctors delivering babies there are midwives, which I'm not gonna get into it, but midwives are basically like, they're trained to deliver babies instead of like a, a doctor that can also deliver babies but does a lot of other things. Midwives deliver babies, that's what they do. So they're super special specialize that and amazing they're incredible and I just like the midwifery standard of care I think it just fits who I am so she transferred me to a hospital with a midwife led unit and I will say that it was such a beautiful choice they could not have been nicer they were wonderful for I mean just I I got there and I was so defeated because at this point I'd been in labor for 12 to 13 hours or 14 hours by the time that I got to the hospital got everything got checked in and I was really tired at this point and kind of exhausted and knew that I had a long road ahead of me and I got there and the midwife and her assistant came in and my god I'd never met them before but they immediately made me feel like a warm hug like they were the nicest people she went over my birth preferences with me and uh, talked to me about everything that I had hoped to have happen talked to me about what the plan was going to be from here and what we can do and that they wanted to work with me. They wanted to get me as close to my birth plan as possible. And they, God, they were the nicest people. They could not have been more just understanding and kind. And you know what? That I really needed that in that moment because I was feeling so defeated by that my body just wasn't doing it. And I don't understand because every birth that I had been to, basically, I watched just the most beautiful calm, peaceful, serene dreams happen for these women. And I wanted that for myself. And I was so disappointed at my body for just not doing it. Like what the fuck is wrong with you? And so I get all the way there and it, it was just a beautiful breath of fresh air to have them come in and be like, you know what? We're gonna work with you. This is going to be what you want it to be. And we're just gonna take it one step at a time. So we talked about everything and they're like, okay, we're gonna get, just monitor the baby for a while. As soon as we get a clear reading on baby, make sure that he's doing well. We're gonna get you hooked up to Pitocin and we're gonna start you off on the absolute lowest dose and every hour we're going to come in and we're going to increase that dose if you're not you know progressing i told them and i was really nervous about not being able to handle the pain because i have heard that pitocin contractions are extremely extremely painful if you don't know pitocin is the synthetic version of oxytocin which is what makes you dilate, what makes you get contractions. They needed to give me a little bit of Pitocin to make my body dilate. Had my water not broken, none of this would have happened. Had I just had contractions, they would let me go way longer. But because we're on the time frame of water being broken, they had to, we have to get the baby out in, in a, in a quicker time frame so that infection doesn't set in. They put me on the monitors. I will say one thing about hospital monitors. They are terrible. It took them five hours to be able to get a half hour of reading on the baby because their monitors kept shorting out or not working. And I wanted the monitors where I could move around because I'm having contractions. Laying on your back is absolute excruciating agony when you're having contractions. And I really just wanted to be upright because being upright helps the baby push on your cervix. You want everything to be as optimal for baby to come down as possible. So gravity is on your side. So I wanted to be upright, but their monitors were such a pain in the ass that I couldn't. I had to sit completely still because every time I would move, it would lose him. And the longer we couldn't get a reading on him, the longer it was until I could get Pitocin. So keep in mind, I've been awake at this point for 
a long time and in labor. And so I'm just losing energy the longer and longer we go. So by 1 a.m., they were finally able to get a consistent reading on the baby, make sure that his heart was good, everything's good, no issues, no decelerations, baby looks good. So then they hooked me up to Pitocin. I wish there were words in the English language to describe what Pitocin contractions are like. As soon as they hooked me up to that, I went from manageable pain of like, this is very intense and I don't know how much more intensity I can handle to another dimension. I am not trying to scare you if you are somebody that is nervous about birth, but I cannot sugarcoat what I experienced. Pitocin contractions was like a contraction on steroids. It was like a contraction from hell, one after the other after the other. When they put me on that and I experienced my first Pitocin contraction, I looked at Zach and I was like, oh my God, like holy shit. Because again, I'm looking to do this without pain medication. Not because I'm trying to be like some, uh, I'm not trying to, I just really wanted to feel everything. I wanted to feel it because I wanted to be able to experience it in its entirety. Okay. So also I have to say that with COVID and the hospital, as soon as I got there, they had me put on a mask while well, I was already wearing a mask. And then they had me put on a face shield on top of that, laboring in that nightmare terrible hated it as soon as we got to the hospital i did not film because it was so much it was so much and you guys it would have been horror to watch it would have been like watching the exorcist there are no hospital clips until after what i'm going to talk about but i will say i had to get a rapid covid test came back negative and they let zach be in there with me thank god it was wonderful they really supported us in that okay so on one on the Pitocin scale. So they, they put it in like, that's how it is. So you start off at one and they increase to two, three. So it's, it's, it's in that way. Um, so they started me off at one and I was shocked at just how instantaneously my contractions ramped right back up and they were at a 10. I mean, it was like, okay, okay, that's what it's like. I really wanted to remember what it felt like. All I can say without trying to be super negative and without being one of those people that's gonna scare people off of, you know, not having, you know, pain relief is that without Pitocin, the contractions were manageable. Intense, but manageable. With it, I, I don't know how to describe it. I apologize if this makes anyone afraid of birth. I don't wanna do that because that was literally my job is to take the fear and stigma away from birth. But it was like horror. Like I cannot describe in words what kind of pain I was experiencing. Editing Christy here. It felt like being cut in half with a chainsaw every 45 seconds. I have a condition called cluster headaches and I've also experienced kidney stones. Those are two things that people compare to labor and pain. Cluster headaches are considered the most painful condition known to man. Kidney stones right up there. Both of those pale in comparison to Pitocin contractions. I was screaming and i'm talking banshee it was like movies when you hear people shrieking the sounds that were coming out of me i was afraid that the women next door giving birth were going to be afraid by the sounds that were coming out of me i was inconsolable the pain was 500 out of 10 but this was me trying to continue my birth preferences to try and have an unmedicated un you know, no pain control childbirth, why? Well, I needed to go through that to know that it wasn't gonna work. And uh, spoiler alert, it didn't. So um, they bumped it up to two after an hour. At one, I thought this is so painful, I can't imagine it being worse. Okay, well, when they bumped it up to two, screaming bloody murder. I was on another planet, you guys. I was not here. I was in another dimension. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was just absolutely grunting, screaming, writhing, trying to climb the walls to escape the feeling of my own body. I went into the bathroom and I thought I need some kind of pain relief. So I was back and forth to the toilet, throwing up constantly, just over and over and over again. The pain was so, so intense that I was vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. And I was like, I need to get in the bathtub and all the monitors are waterproof, thank God. So I was able to get in the bathtub. Did it help? Absolutely not. Did it at least give me something? My husband was an absolute saint during all of this. He was in the bathroom with me. He was rubbing my back. He was getting me whatever I needed, getting me Gatorade, getting me water, helping me just do whatever he could do. And at some point, it was probably closer to five o'clock in the morning. I had been laboring on Pitocin with no pain relief 
for at this point five hours or four or five hours i looked at him and i said i think i'm going to die and he was like you're not going to die and i was like no zach i think i might die and in that moment i really did think i might die and i can sit here and say this right now after birth i couldn't even speak these words i could not get through this story without sobbing because in that moment the helplessness that i felt was unmatched i've never experienced a pain like that in my entire life my god holy shit so i got to about five o'clock in the morning and i had been on it since one i've been laboring on it for four hours at this point and i looked at the nurse and god bless her god bless that nurse i feel so bad for her i feel so bad that she had to be there with me going through that they were just looking at me like oh god so i looked at her and i was like i need something gas and air gas and air and Bless her soul, she got it for me in about 30 seconds. There was no like waivers or anything I had to sign. She brought it in and it's basically, it's nitrous and mixed with oxygen. Same thing you get like at the dentist. And I said, what is this gonna do? What is this gonna make me feel like? And they were like, it can just make you feel kind of lightheaded. It can take away your anxiety and take the edge off. <laughs> Not of Pitocin contractions. Uh -uh. All it did was make me talk like this. I was literally talking in slow motion. It sounded like I was hammer drunk, like I had 50 beers, but it didn't feel like I had 50 beers. It made me feel high as hell, but it didn't take the pain away. So it, it just made me loony tunes. I was talking like this. And the nurses were all laughing at me. I don't know, man, I don't do drugs. So I was like high as shit off of that nitrous. It made me feel crazy. It made the room like feel super, it made me lightheaded and made everything feel bizarre. It didn't take the pain away, but it did. It just did something. It just changed a facet of it. I was just sucking in the nitrous as hard as I could just to take any bit of edge off that I could. That Pitocin was so terrible. When she, when she bumped it up to two, I looked at her and I said, if you make it a three, I will kill you. I just looked at the nurse. I said, I can't do it. You can't do it to me. Mothers, you you are incredible, incredible. And if anyone has ever made you feel sad or bad about having to do what you need to do during birth, literally those people can, and I say this with the utmost disrespect, get fucked. During this Pitocin time, there was a point where I said, the baby's gotta be in the wrong position. He has to be, because why isn't it dilating my cervix? When you're a doula, you learn something called sifting with a rebozo. Basically, it's a big piece of fabric, or you can use a sheet, and they lift up on your belly, and they shimmy, 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 and that can shimmy the baby's head into the correct position. But before we did that, they had me turn on my side with my leg hanging over the side of the bed, and they pushed on my hip, and at times, that can help the baby move into the correct position as well. They could tell that he was not posterior. They could tell that he was in the correct position. His body was, but his head was down by my cervix. So you really couldn't get a good feel of his head, but his body was in the right position. He was back to front. So he was anterior, not posterior, which is good. That's what they want them to be. And so I just thought there's gotta be, he's gotta be in the wrong position. So I was hands and knees. I was moving, I was squatting. I was doing everything to get the baby into the right position. Everything that I had learned in all of my doula training, everything that I had learned, watching birthing videos and everything, just nothing was working. So that was during the Pitocin times. So, so at seven o'clock in the morning, screaming, bloody murder, every 30 seconds, one contraction on top of the other, for sure, this is doing something. There's no way it can be this painful, this hideous, this horrific, this intense, and not be dilating my cervix. Not humanly possible. So they checked me at seven o'clock in the morning, three centimeters dilated, 50% effaced. At this point, I had been in labor for 26 hours and I had a mental breakdown. I was laying in the bed after she checked me and the look on her face, I will never forget, the look on everyone's face. There was the midwife, the midwife's assistant, two nurses, and a couple of other people in the room. I don't know who they were. And this was a low point for me. And I felt so bad because Zach's face, I and mean, he was just defeated and upset and crying along with me. But I was laying in that bed and I was looking up at all these people surrounding me and I just started sobbing, like inconsolably sobbing, apologizing to every woman who had ever gone through labor before me, apologizing for ever being judgmental for anyone, for any way that they decided to birth, apologetic for everybody that's experienced what I'm going through, or somebody being downplayed in any way, or having anyone say, oh, have you tried it unmedicated? I was so sorry for ever having thought, any thought whatsoever in any way about anyone's birth story. I was crushed for all people out there who had experienced birth and this pain and were downplayed. I was crushed for anyone who was ever 
made by somebody that had a natural childbirth to feel like they were in any way less than. I had just experienced what I had seen some of my clients experience when I was a doula, where I was saying, just breathe, fucking, really, really? Okay, just breathe. I was breathing, I was writhing. It was unfucking bearable un believable and I was so sick to my stomach sorry for anyone that had ever experienced anything like that and was met with anything other than such love and support because what I had just experienced up until that point was the most defeating moment of my life being there and knowing that I had just gone through 50 out of 10 pain 500 out of 10 pain the worst pain I've ever experienced in my entire life for nothing was one of the lowest points and so I looked at the nurses and doctors and I said I Give me the epidural, I have to. I cannot do this for one more second. 27 hours of labor, not a single bit of progression over that time. I was running out of energy and I had been on Pitocin for I think six or seven hours with no pain control and it wasn't working. And so um, obviously I would do what needed to be done and we were always monitoring the baby and monitoring me to make sure that everybody was good. I didn't have a fever, baby's heart rate was good throughout this entire time. So that's why we kept going. We're 27 hours post water breaking at this point. I am exhausted and I get the epidural. So the anesthesiologist comes in and asks me like, what's your biggest fear? Because what is the main reason that you don't want one? And I said, you know, I've known people to get spinal headaches from it. I, get, I have a headache disorder. I try to avoid headaches at all costs. I really know the how life ruining they are and you can't really enjoy an experience when you're in a, like a constant state of pain in your head. He gave me huge reassurance. He was the nicest man. And he said, you know, in my 25 years of being an anesthesiologist, I have seen about 10 women get spinal headaches. And he said, as long as you sit very still, you're not gonna get one. I did not move a muscle. I really didn't want to get one. And he was so good. He was so fast. He was so, um, he had such a calming presence about him that when he was putting the epidural in, I mean, they kind of do it in the middle of a contraction because he says that that'll distract you from it. It seems counterintuitive, but it really did help. And he, um, put the epidural in and it took him maybe five minutes or less to do the entire procedure. And within 10 minutes of getting the epidural placed, the amount of relief that I experienced, Oh my God, it was beautiful. It was so wonderful. Hi guys. Tuesday, December 1st. Tuesday, December 1st. I don't know what you've seen or what I've shown, but basically- I haven't shown anything since we got here. Not one thing, we haven't filmed I'm anything. I'm so sorry. It's okay because it was, uh, it was a lot. It was something. It was, whew. I wouldn't have wanted to relive what we just lived. <laughs> it's a lot. I got an epidural at eight just to get some rest. We had been awake for about 28, 28, 28 hours, hours at that hours. point. And not just awake, but awake and my body is running a marathon, you know? It's about 12.30 right now. We rested. Zach slept. I was able to get some in and out of sleep. My, 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 Same. yeah, my, yeah. uh, my brain's not letting me sleep. I don't really understand. It's very irritating. They uh, they checked me again just now after four hours on the epidural and just resting and I'm at a six and about 80% effaced. So I am, it seems like the epidural is just, it's doing what it needs to do. It's and what you needed. I, I had a mental breakdown last night. I've- um, And then I had one yeah. just now. It's so intense, you guys. Like, I have the world's most utmost respect for mothers. It is, words cannot describe what, what, they, what you go through. I mean, it's like, I just, it makes me choke up because it's like, you know, I took all the, the hypnobirthing courses and I read the books and I did all the stuff and you think like I I'm going to be able to do this and I why doesn't everybody do that and then you you know maybe your body doesn't progress and you just don't know why and you've tried sifting you've tried walking you've tried you know you squatting and sitting on the toilet sitting on the birth ball getting in the tub you know trying to do anything that you can and Sometimes it just doesn't do anything. And I never thought that I would be one of those people. And I feel like 
it's to make me a more compassionate person. I really do. Like if there's a lesson in any of this, it's to make me a more compassionate person towards other people who have experienced this because it is so mentally, physically, it's more than just exhausting. It's um heavy. And the nurse is a subscriber. <laughs> she walked in, she was like, Chris, hey, Rob, you do your thing. The baby's doing really good. They have him hooked up to monitors. Um, and his heart rate has been good. My contractions are strong. I cannot feel them anymore, but I'm still on Pitocin. And I don't want to suffer anymore. I don't want you to. It's the worst thing that I've ever experienced is watching you suffer. It was the worst thing I've ever experienced. Okay. okay. Well, we're going to go um, and relax. And Zach's going to eat. And I'm going to yeah. stare at his food. We just con the hospital out of two pieces of pizza. Good birthday. One two o oh, one two o oh, two o. Oh. Whoa. So they bumped up the pitocin to eight because you know what? Let's get your cervix dilating. So if you want to know what it feels like to get an epidural, it feels like when your leg has fallen asleep and then it starts to come back alive and it's completely like, it feels like TV static in your legs. Like it's just really intense, um, numb. They are numb to the nth degree. Like somebody could poke your legs and you would not feel anything. Wow, I was able to rest. Weirdly, I couldn't sleep. I don't know why, but I couldn't sleep. I think it's just the adrenaline in general of like knowing that my baby was gonna be here soon, the amount of pain that I had been in prior, and just, it was almost like I was overtired to the point where I could not sleep. I could not shut my brain off. And so for the next 10 hours or 12 hours, they just let me dilate. Baby was doing super well. I was doing well, no fever, no nothing. Everything was good. Heart rates on both of us, awesome. But think about <laughs> like a puzzle fitting. So when their head isn't just right, especially asynclitic, cause they're like off to the side. Mm -hmm. So here's your cervix. Your baby was like doing this to the side of it. Instead of right in the Instead center. Instead of like bam, right in the middle. Oh, so you're so close but so yeah, far. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the work of your contractions is rotate the baby and get it there. And that's usually what happens. Either it doesn't rotate all the way, but it gets pushed to the center and baby comes out. Um, so your baby just wasn't doing that. It, I mean. And we tried to, and, like, we you did know, sifting, we did yeah. position changes. I was like squatting, ball. Yeah. So I feel like we gave him every opportunity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he was just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm like a bull getting the, a rail here in the fence. I'm, I like it. I want to keep doing this. Okay. And you know, once your pelvis relaxed, he's like, oh, well, you're going to do it. We're going to see this baby sometime today. So okay. yeah, that's a good oh birthday. God. He's pushing his head really hard against that cervix. So he wants to come out. Cool. Yeah. And he's doing okay. He looks great. Yeah. He hasn't bothered labor. It's not bothering him. Cool. He's a chill guy. Yeah. Good. He better be after this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he better sleep, mister. Gosh, Can I you believe so. it? <laughs> I don't know, not yet. Eight centimeters. <sighs> that's a good number. That's only two more, and we're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bro. Yeah. Oh my god, we're gonna go home with a baby so. Gosh, I can't wait. <laughs> we never will not have a baby ever again. You know, I've said, like, oh, I'm not ready. This was God preparing me for being ready. ready. Just like, hey, I'm ready to get out, you know? <laughs> That's that. It honestly feels like I'm made of sand bags. <laughs> yeah. Feels like it, I'm sure, when she's rolling you over. It is so bizarre. And then about two hours after that, they checked me again and I was at 10 and she was like, all right, we can start pushing. So yeah, just a little piece of cervix, so not much longer. We'll probably start pushing soon. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I can't Yay. believe it. <laughs> it's been like I mean, there's only a little piece of cervix, so even if it was stubborn and didn't want to go away, you could push and I could push it out of the way. Okay. So the cervix isn't going to be an issue. Okay. okay. And your baby is really pushing itself down, so. <laughs> All indications look like baby wants to come out. Come out, yeah. Thank you. Good job. Thank you so much. You're doing great. Hearing that I was at 10 centimeters dilated was one of the most incredible moments 
my body did it and she looked at me and she's like you're gonna push this baby out and it was such a beautiful moment after all the horror that had led up to this and this was at about i think at about around 8 p.m maybe a little after 8 p.m i was awake at this point for i think i think i was at like 39 hours of labor at this point which is a really long time and so I was finally able to do something and I had them turn the epidural down so I could really feel a lot of what was happening. I felt all of the sensations of pushing. I felt the baby moving down. I felt his head coming out. I felt everything, but without the pain, it was beautiful. Like if I could say that my favorite part of the entire experience was pushing, it was so empowering. It was so powerful. It was so wonderful. And I feel like I did a pretty good job. Like when she was, uh, you know, telling me how to push it was really 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 she would be like okay that spot and i'd be like oh that's how you want me to do it because you really can't feel a lot so it's really hard to know but i was pushing so so hard and i was able to move the baby down i think i pushed for about an hour and a half and it was so wonderful zach was loving it i mean he his face his excitement his energy was something that could keep me going forever it was absolutely incredible to have him be there watching and he loved it. I mean, he said it was the highlight of his entire life watching our baby be born. Do you want to touch his head? Oh, oh. oh my God. <laughs> Squishy. It's not something he ever thought he would have loved as much as he did, but after everything we had been through and after all of that and after the tears and after me saying I think I was gonna die and him saying that was like the most scared he's ever been. And I finally was able to push the baby out and it was so cool because they actually let Zach birth him. So the midwife was like, come on dad, come come down here and let's get your son out. And so on that final push, I it was so cool because when they told me when I was crowning, when his head is coming out and I felt his head pop out. Like I could, I literally, she would be like, push, push, push. And I push and I could feel his head pop. And it was so cool because you know, at that point, like it's just the body at this point. And then Zach was able to pull him out of me. And then they let me pull him up onto my chest. Again, that's it, that's it, that's it. Strong, strong, strong. That's it, good job. Hello, baby. Oh 
And that moment, I will never forget that moment. Like it was the most incredible moment of my life. And uh, it went downhill really fast after that. He's not crying, so, so if we delay it, it will actually... Okay. Here, Zach, can cut real quick right there? Oh no. I know. Well, he had the cord around his neck oh, and some podium did. behind him, so he was a little stressed by that. Of everything. The unmedicated, none of that stuff mattered to me as much as what happens after my son was born. And I might cry and I'm sorry, but this is the point where it gets traumatic for me. And remember, I never thought I was gonna be a mom. I never thought I was gonna have a baby. And I never thought I would be able to say that I have a son, much less pull my son up onto my chest myself to have him on my chest and be able to look down at him. And to be able to Hold him on me. <sighs> Zach got to pull him for the majority and I got to pull him up onto me. And then that's when everything changed. So you're in a whirlwind. I mean, there's so much going on. And I pulled him up onto me and it got really quiet all of a sudden. Um, and everybody started kind of it just got really busy. It got really busy. I just remember her saying what felt like two seconds after he was on my chest, but rewatching the footage back, it wasn't two seconds. It was probably 10, 15 seconds after he's born. And they're kind of rubbing him and trying to figure out like, oh, okay. And she said, okay, mama, we're gonna have to clamp the cord. And I said, no, because I didn't know why she was saying that. I didn't know. I was in a daze. I was like, no, no, why? Because it was really important to me that he get all of his blood if he could, because it's good, it's good for him. And, um, and she goes, okay, well, he's not crying. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And so they clamp his cord and they take him away. They rush him over to the little warmer. And because he had had meconium um, in my water and because my water had been broken for this point for about 40 hours, which they've monitored him the whole time. He was always good, his heart rate was always good. They would have not let me go that long. It was all their decision. They, they were like, you know what, this is what we're gonna do. Everybody's good and as long as everybody's healthy and you don't have a fever and his heart rate is good, we can you know, let it go. So they, um, their maximum is 48 hours. So we were nearing it. They did have the NICU team standing by though in the room just in case something like this happened. They rushed him over to the warmer and Zach and I are just standing there watching as they're over there and the room is pin drop silent. Like just it, the whole atmosphere changed from the, the exciting birthday of my son, my miracle son that we didn't ever know we would be able to have to like horror. Um, and they rushed him over there to the warmer. And for now that I've seen the footage back, it was about three minutes, which count to 30 seconds and count how long 30 seconds is. Now count a minute. Now two, now three. That was how long I didn't know that my son, if my son was alive. This is why it was traumatic. It wasn't any of the stuff leading up. That was all a lot. And having my birth go from water birth that I wanted with my son on my chest to my son over in a warmer with a, an entire NICU team surrounding him, patting on his back, shaking him, rubbing him, and not hearing a single cry for three minutes was the worst moment of my entire life. Because I was asking, is he okay? Is he okay? And you're not getting a response back because they don't know. And they're not gonna say yes if they don't know. And the whole team is surrounding him. And you know, I didn't get to see him. I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know anything. And all of these people have their hands all over him. They're trying to make sure that he's alive. And I looked up at Zach and I said, I can't believe, I can't believe he's gone. I cannot believe, I can't believe it, that this is what happened after everything. And then we heard a little squeak come from him and both Zach and I broke. That was the single most relieving moment of both of our lives, hearing that little squeak from that little boy. And as soon as I heard that, I said, is he okay? And they were like, he's okay, he's okay. And Zach ran over and was, you know, looking at him and he got to be with him and he got to hold his hand. 
and they were like, we're gonna take him down to the NICU. We need to monitor him for a minimum of four hours. And they did bring him over to me um, for just one minute or so before they brought him down to the NICU so that I could see him and hold him for just a second. They're gonna bring him over. I know, but he didn't want to see him. I know, I know, baby. I know. And you go with them downstairs and you stay with him. Bring him right he's gonna be fine. 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 He's gonna
was like nothing I had ever experienced in my life and like nothing I was ever told might happen. It was so, so much. And it was two days we were there post. I mean, we didn't get home until Thursday. And I think that I went into labor on a Sunday or a Monday. I got two hours of sleep, I think. And I wouldn't even call it sleep, more rest in six days. Couldn't believe it. I have never been more tired in my life. I started to um, get uh, hallucinations and stuff. This is all the stuff I'm gonna talk about in the postpartum video. It is critically not talked about enough while simultaneously being the most wonderful because I've got my brand new baby and I, I can't. I'm, I cannot describe the feeling and the love and the bond and the connection and the tears and the feeling of holding your baby is like nothing anyone can explain to you. Zach's got him right now. He's in there napping with him and he's just the light of my life. I love him more than I could ever put into words, you guys. He's so wonderful. And uh, yeah. We've got our baby. Me and Zach look at him every day and we're like, how did we make this perfect angel? How did we have this perfect baby? How? Look who it is. Oh my. You go say hi. Oh my goodness. What the heck? Where are you? Buddy. Look how big you are already. Look how big you are already. Nine weeks almost, my baby. Nine weeks almost, my baby. Nine weeks almost, my baby. And I love him so much. And I love him so much. He's my baby. He's my silly guy. He's smiling and, oh, sneezing. <clears throat> Bless you. His smiles and his giggles. He doesn't like have a full giggle yet, but kind of one of those little <clears throat> Oh, and yawning, even though he has been sweeping all day. He is so absolutely grumpy. Yes, he does, I guess, so absolutely grumpy. I love you. You are a big boy. He was such a tiny little baby, now he's such a big boy. Oh my gosh, mommy loves you so much, buddy. Say hi to everybody. Say hi. That's my birth story. And it was so intense, you guys. I hope I don't scare anyone out of you know anything, but things can be so different from what you hope. So my biggest piece of advice is, you know, you can have your birth preferences and you can have your plan and you can have your dream, but just know it can stray from that. And even as if you're the most prepared, if you've read all the books, if you've been practicing for weeks, if you've been practicing your positive affirmations and your birth quotes and your breathing and, and you're trying to remain positive, sometimes things just have their own plan. I thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, I don't know how frequently I'm gonna be putting up videos or anything like that. I'm just trying to, you know, take things one day at a time and thank you for being kind and uh, I hope that I can keep the comments on and I appreciate you remaining positive in the comments. But I definitely am gonna be talking about you know motherhood and postpartum here on my channel because it's been the biggest life change I've ever experienced in my life and this channel is not just makeup, it is raw beauty, Christy. Beauty is just one aspect of that. But the other portions are me just being open, honest, raw and myself. And right now I'm a new mama and that's what I wanna talk about. So, all right, well, I thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you at my next video. Bye. We are better mommy. We love your real mommy. You actually love your mommy. It's his first time laughing, and I get it. Mommy, 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 mommy. You better love your mommy. You better love your mommy right, right now. You better not get about me right now. <laughs> <laughs>